All right, well, hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Science, and it's my pleasure this afternoon to introduce Mark Danielson, who will be presenting on the Micaela Bastidas Rebellion, uh, which is an outgrowth of a project he did with me last fall in the course uh, that I teach on modern Latin America. So please join me in welcoming him. So if you had to guess the total population of Earth from its beginning to now, what would be your guess? Throw them out. We'll all be wrong Seven together. Billion. Seven billion. Well, the number is actually a little bit higher than that. The Population Reference Bureau estimates this number is around 108 billion people. Now, the trouble with this, in regards to history, is that there are simply too many people to document. Historians must then establish a hierarchy of just who deserves to be remembered and who does not. In this way, historians function as gatekeepers of societal memory. Now, the issue with this, when it comes to marginalized populations, is that their stories can often be lost, can often become ignored, or become twisted to fit a larger narrative. Today, to illustrate this phenomenon, I want to bring you the story of just one historical figure who deserves a larger place in our societal memory. And then I'll go on to discuss some of the struggles of maintaining historical accuracy in today's day and age. So, as Dr. Stein said, my name is Mark Danielson. Um, I'm a history major here at Adams State. Um, and my project is titled The Micaela Bastidas Rebellion How Bias in Historiography Affects Marginalized Populations, Past, Present, and Future. Um, so, I want to start off by stating that I draw upon the work of Charles Walker's The Tupac Amaru Rebellion. Um, and I think it's a fantastic contribution to the scholarship of the rebellion. But why I chose to um, explore it more is Walker had all of the evidence to go much further in his assertions of Mikael Basidas' role in the rebellion. But he fails to make that ideological leap. And it is this ideological leap that I wish to present to you today. So, a little bit of background on the Inca Empire prior to Spanish arrival in 1532. Um, the Inca Empire was vast um, and stretched along the west coast of South America. Um, the Inca were constantly incorporating new peoples, um, so their population was always growing, and at its height, just before Spanish arrival, it totaled around 12 million. Now I show you these next pictures to demonstrate the advanced nature of the Inca. Often, unfortunately, in scholarship, it is easy for historians to downplay the ingenuity of South American civilizations. Um, so some of their achievements include these large connected stones uh, in Cusco, the empire's capital city. And then on the bottom right here is an example of what an Inca road would look like. So fast forwarding to the 18th century. The old Inca empire had been controlled by the Spanish for two centuries. The rule is often brutal and harsh to the natives of the empire. So this map is, um, lays out the Spanish holdings in the Americas. Um, and it's great because it lays out modern borders as well, so you can really get a sense of where we are. Um, so our story will take place in the vice royalty of Peru. So, and now we meet our protagonist, Miguel Basidas Uyukawa. She was born in 1744 in the Canas region of the vice royalty of Peru. Um, she belonged to the indigenous population of native Quechua speakers. Um, and her husband. Jose Gabriel Condorcan Cui Noguera. And he would adopt the name of Tupac Amaru after the last Incan emperor. Uh, Noguera served as a Caraca, or principal governor of his province. And because of this position, he was really the right man to start a rebellion. Um, but perhaps more notably, he had the right woman by his side as well. So, the rebellion itself. The rebellion kicked off after Tupac Amaru assassinated Spanish official Antonio de Arriaga in November of 1780. The rebellion then got tr caught traction due to the, quote, increasing frustration with the colonial system, a firmer and more intrusive royal authority, increasing and efficiently collected taxes, and mounting competition for native labor and surplus, increased Creole frustration with the broader social and political prerogatives held by Peninsulares. Peninsulares for the uninitiated being those born on the Iberian Peninsula of Spain. Um, so all of these 
um, new intrusive um, changes and subsequent frustrations were brought about by the Bourbon reforms in which Spain attempted to tighten its grip on its holdings in the Americas. Tupac Amaru would state to the Spanish among cap uh, after being captured, you and I are the only ones guilty for the bloodshed. You for oppressing this kingdom with excessive and new taxes, and I for wanting to liberate it from this tyranny and humiliation. Now one of the most fascinating aspects of the rebellion is it is almost a purely indigenous uprising. The other rebellions of the time simply do not have this native aspect, and it's simply due to the huge population that the Inca had. So now on to Micaela's role in the rebellion. Micaela contributed in a vast amount of ways to the rebellion and was really instrumental in almost every piece. Quote, Micaela was a full partner in Jose Gabriel's enterprises. While he was away in Lima or elsewhere, she managed his business and Caracas affairs. This helps explain how she proved to be such an exceptionally able leader of the, of the rebellion. She excelled at paying the troops, managing supplies, keeping discipline, posting sentinels, and watching for spies. All the intricate logistics that make up military campaigns. Now I want to draw a dichotomy between our two figures. On one hand, Tupac Amaru was really concerned with a type of symbolic leadership, so he would give rousing speeches that really inspired the native base. But Mikael, on the other hand, was much more of a boots-on-the-ground logistical leader. And both are important, but all of the inspiration in the world really goes nowhere without concrete planning. And there are numerous primary sources um, that regard Miguel in this commander role. So, what happened? So, the couple were captured after months of waging their total war um, all throughout the Viceroyalty of Peru. At the end, over 100,000 people would be dead. Upon their capture, they were quickly judged guilty of fomenting rebellion. And a date was set for their execution. And on that day, and I'll read directly from the locker here, On that day, quote, their hands and feet tied tight, the prisoners were dragged behind horses, their skins scraping on the cobblestone streets. I'll skip ahead here a bit, but both Micaela and her husband had to watch as all but one of their children and all of Micaela's brothers were executed in various ways. Quote, Micaela was then led to the gallows. Executioners slashed her tongue. They then strapped her into the garrote, pictured here. According to one account, her neck was too thin for the garrote to work, so the executioners instead strangled her with a rope and kicked her until her death. While historians disagree about the execution technique, everyone agrees that it was agony. Fernando, Michaela's ten-year-old son, the only son who was spared, upon witnessing the death of his parents, quote, uttered a heart-rending shriek, the knell of which continued to ring in the ears of those who heard it to their dying day. It was the death knell of Spanish rule in South America. Now, Tupac Amaru's execution would prove to be even more brutal than Miguel's. And after this, the rebellion continued in pockets in the south and became more bloody than ever, but this was really the death blow of the rebellion. After their execution, various limbs of the couple were severed and then sent to various cities around the empire. <clears throat> the message was clear. This is the price of rebellion. And the message stuck, Peru not gaining its independence until 1821, making it one of the last countries in South America. Now, interestingly, a Spanish woman would definitely not have been executed like this. But because Miguela was a woman, because she was an indigenous woman, all bets were off. And this really proves my thesis. The Spanish recognized what an important player Miguela was in the rebellion. And that's why they gave her such a brutal and symbolic execution. Now moving on from some of the pure history stuff. Earlier I showed you this picture of Miguel Vasinas. What I did not tell you, however, is this picture is a lie. Miguel Vasinas most certainly did not look like this. Quote, documents refer to her as Zamba, or one with cinnamon colored skin, implying that she had black blood, end quote. She's described as a, quote, beautiful Indian girl. And no accounts describe her as anywhere near fair-skinned. When she is portrayed with whiter skin as she is here, 
This points to her being above the average indigenous Mestizo woman, which she certainly was not. She was indigenous, and this simply did not fit the larger historical narrative. But this isn't the first or the last time historians would do this. They've been guilty of whitewashing historical figures for centuries. Now, a response you all might have is, why does this even matter? Who cares how someone's painted, right? And I can certainly understand that logic, but I implore you to think of the larger ramifications when it comes to historical figures. When we whiten a historical figure's skin, we're twisting history to fit a less than savory narrative. There's a vast list of victims of this kind of whitewashing. This list includes Beethoven, Frederick Douglass, Queen Charlotte of England, Cleopatra, and Alexandre Dumas. When we take a historical figure and we whiten their skin, we're not only disrespecting that person, we're not only disrespecting the whole culture to which they belong, but we're disrespecting the sanctity of history. Now another response you might have is, how is this still a thing? Why do we still do this as a society? And this is a hard question to answer, right? It's complicated. Why is white skin more commercially viable? All of these complex and painful questions have equally complex and painful answers. But there is progress on this front. Nowadays, advertisers, directors, makeup companies, and even historians can't really get away with this without there being some sort of public backlash. Now, a little on the historiography of Bastidas' memory. Um, historiography being the study of historical writing, um, basically the history of history. Um, so for centuries, she had a role downplayed in the rebellion. And it's for this reason that I call for a new historiography that better understands the complex relationship between Miguela and the rebellion. Now, she could have had her role downplayed for three main reasons, which I'll cover next. One is testimony. Um, when her and Tupac Amaru were captured, they both, in a con what seemed to be a concerted effort, really tried to intentionally downplay the role she played in the rebellion. Um, it's clear that they were lying, and we're not really sure why they did this. Perhaps it was an attempt for the couple to save Miguela from execution, as Tupac Amaru was definitely going to be executed. Now, the second um, explanation is Spanish manipulation or Spanish suppression. So because this happened in Spanish-controlled territory, obviously they were the ones who were in charge of collecting information and then writing about the event. Now, a rebellion this devastating in their colonies would certainly be a black eye for the Spanish. But a rebellion this bad led by an indigenous woman would undoubtedly be worse. And the third explanation is perhaps the most simple. Micaela Basidas committed the sin of being a woman at a time when little historical scholarship was, was concerned with the role of women in shaping history. We can't know if this was intentional or not. All we do know is that they had the exact same records we do today, and yet they clearly neglected what is such an integral part of the rebellion. Now expanding on this, it's impossible not to think about the scores of women who have undoubtedly been forgotten in time. If this happened to Miguel Basidas, how many others has it happened to? Now, you may think we have made sufficient progress on all of these points. You may think that today we wouldn't miss out on recognizing a historical figure like Micaela. I truly hope this is true, but recent rhetoric has me very concerned for our future. We're seeing very troubling rhetoric at the highest echelons of our society, and I fear that history will forget those who are the victims of this kind of rhetoric. Now, I don't want you to misinterpret me. We certainly have made progress on all of these issues. I know this to be true. As anecdotal as it might be, it reminds me of, of a time where my mom had an exchange with a woman who came up to her and said that she recognized her from the school, from her son's school. Um, she said, I know I recognize you. Aren't, aren't you the bus driver? And my mom said, no. And she said, the janitor? My mom was the vice principal of the school at this time. And it was cringy and as awkward as this story might be, my grandma had to grow up with signs like these. 
Here's my point. We've certainly made progress on all of these issues. However, this language, these ideas, they still exist. They just exist beneath the surface, in coded language. Now, the next slide I'm about to show you contains a quote. It's a quote from strategist Lee Atwater that outlines what he called the Southern strategy in which um, Republican candidates appealed to racist dogma. Now, it contains a word that I'm not going to say, but I included the full quote here because it's important to respect historical accuracy. You start out in 1954 by saying the word. By 1968, you can't say the word. That hurts you, backfires. So you say stuff like forced busing, states' rights, and all that stuff. And you're getting so abstract, and now you're talking about cutting taxes. And all these things you're talking about are totally economic things. And a byproduct of them is blacks get hurt worse than whites. We want to cut this is much more abstract than even the busing thing and a hell of a lot more abstract than the word. I included these pictures here at the bottom to demonstrate the extent that this type of ideology has penetrated our society. Now, politicians today have been getting bold. <coughs> They've traded in a dog whistle for a bullhorn and do little to code their racist language. Today it is so important that we respect historical accuracy. We must ensure that those exceptional individuals who are making history are recognized, regardless of their race, their creed, their gender, their sexual orientation, or their geographic location. Mikael Abbasidas is a name we should remember, a name we should know. But we don't. We don't know her, and we don't remember her, because she was an indigenous woman of color in a time when historians just didn't care about that. Of thing. Now, we have much to learn from Mikael Basidas's memory. There are so many pertinent and timely reminders that often what is believed is a perversion of truth by those in control. Now, just wrapping up here, in today's extreme climate, we must ensure that the marginalized do not become the unrecognized. We must use education and respect historical accuracy to prepare for tomorrow, today. Thank you very much for your time. This is my bibliography. Um, so if anyone has some cues, I will try to give you some pace. Yes, Dr. So, Science. Mark, in all of your research, uh, it sounds like you came across some surprising stuff. What, what, what surprised you the most? As far as Mikael Basidas? Yeah. Um, I think maybe the most surprising thing was just all of the evidence, the first-hand accounts, that really stated how important she was in the rebellion. Um, and for whatever reason, she's just not mentioned, right? She's the wife of Tupac Amaro. Um, so just the, the plain evidence being right there, and yet it being neglected for centuries, you know, until very recently. Any other questions? Uh, I'm, I'm curious. Um, you said Peru was the last of the countries to gain their independence of South American. One of the last. Yes, they weren't the last. Why do you suppose they were towards the end? I think that the legacy of this rebellion really stuck in their minds. Um, <coughs> I know there's first-hand accounts of, of this being the case. Um, just what a powerful symbol to have a rebellion leader's head, you know, mm -hmm. in, your, in your town square for everyone to see. I think that kind of thing really sticks in the population's mind. Um, you know, what a clear message that that's the cost of rebellion. Anyone else? Yeah. Yeah, I was actually curious. Is the whitewashing of historical figures something that it, many, histori many historians are conscious of today, or is it something that we need to 
be more conscious of today and in the future? I think it's something that we definitely still need to be pretty conscious of. Um, I think there's definitely been more of an effort, you know, than in the past um, to respect that sort of thing. But, I mean, the example of Frederick Douglass really sticks in my mind. Um, his portrait in the Smithsonian, um, look it up sometime. It's, it's really kind of shocking how white his portrait is. <laughs> Dr. C. How would you respond when we as educators point, try to point these things out and we get accused of liberal bias? Is that we're just doing a plain ignorance of cultural politics, cultural wars? Sure. Uh, That's a tough question. Yeah, it is. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for I that really very do. tough question. Um, you know, I think that sure there are things that are liberal bias, sure. But I think there comes a time where objective is objective, right? So we have to be conscious of, of that and presenting the truth, regardless if some people don't like it, right? And I think that's what it comes down to, if that answers your question. Anyone else? Yes. How many people like, do you think were like, just erased or given, like, or were someone else was credited with their work? I don't know. A lot. Um, there's really no way to know, you know. Unfortunately, <coughs> that time has passed, you know, and we've gotten a pretty incredible second chance, you know, with the story of Miguel Basidas to really revisit this and say, we messed this up. Like, we as historians did not do a good job at really representing what happened. Um, so, countless, unfortunately. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. How does the process of like a, a history book, I mean obviously there's editors and things like that, but like is this something that's like a publisher kind of thing and an editor kind of issue in getting this information into like a US history textbook, for example? Yeah, so what are your thoughts on that? There's definitely a, a distinctive split between like textbook history and like historiography, right? So like this being an example of someone, you know, a, a scholar who published a book and then it goes through, you know, rigorous peer review sessions, um, and people comment on it. They like it. They don't like it. They liked this about it. They didn't like this. You know, as far as the method, metho you know, the methods. Um, but let's um, yeah. say, did, did that answer your question? Or? Uh, a little bit. Expand. Um, yeah. Expand. I was thinking like in the textbook context, so like I'm a middle school student, high school student, I go into my, my history class that's typically historically been a U.S. history class, mm -hmm. um, and the teachers are often using some sort of textbook. They maybe supplement with other books, but that's usually, they're usually tied to some sort of curriculum of some sort and yeah. choosing a textbook of some sort. Um, what are your thoughts around um, getting stories like the ones you presented here today into those textbooks. Is that an issue of historians not putting those things in? Like, is that an editorial thing? Is that people that control the textbooks yeah. are all rich white guys kind of thing, maybe? You know what I mean? <laughs> Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, I kind of misunderstood. No, you're fine. Um, so I think, I think that really what that comes down to is that textbooks, you know, especially at the high school level or middle school level, are really covering basic things, right? So it's not until you get to, you know, a college level class that explores, you know, something like an obscure Peruvian revolution in 1780. Yeah, right? but there are basic things that have happened that aren't being presented too, right? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so I mean, I mean, I think of Caesar too far Chavez, into like, the... I definitely didn't learn about Caesar Chavez in middle school or high school history, yeah. for example. Yeah. And I know there's been a lot of critiques written uh, about the textbook industry, um, how it's uh, primarily controlled by McGraw-Hill, um, and so that it presents, you know, one version of history. Um, I remember that uh, I saw a, a, a screenshot of a history book, um, a U.S. history book that that stated the Atlantic slave trade and referred to them as workers. Um, so. 
there are definitely huge problems. And I think that's, that that's mainly an editing and a funding thing more than a historian thing. But, yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? I think that's, I think we're good. We're ready for the next one. All right.